So welcome to the final plenary session, and uh, we are very pleased and honored to have uh, two distinguished scholars to give us uh, the talk. And the first one is uh, Professor Martin Jones. Martin is uh, George Pitt Rivers Professor of Archaeological Science in Anthropology and uh, Archaeology Department in Cambridge, and he's also the fellow and the vice master of the Darwin College. And he's going to talk about food econ economics in prehistorical times. Thank Martin. you very much, Li Ping. And thank you, um, all the pages organizers, for um, in inviting uh, us along. And as I understand, expanding the remit to make uh, the human dimension more um, uh, prominent. Many institutions wouldn't let archaeologists through the door, so I appreciate your <laughs> flexibility in having us on board. And I sincerely say I've learned an enormous amount to my benefit from uh, listening to the exciting papers here. And one of the things they've made me um, are very aware of is it, when I uh, hear all these elegant global models um, of how much within anthropology and archaeology over the last 30 years, generalization has become unfashionable. There's a lot of uh, research in my department, which is along the lines, I study the substance sub society, and they do things differently there. And uh, so if, if we're looking at models that involve humans, we see other disciplines um, bring in ideas that we might regard as a bit dated or coming from outside the field. Uh, I think we only have ourselves to blame. And for that reason, today I'm going to be unfashionable and uh, generalize a bit about uh, human feud relations in the past. And uh, but I'm very aware in making a generalization. The generalizations, rather like models, are probably more interesting when they're proven wrong than when they're proven plausible. So um, with that in mind, this is basically the paradox that I'm going to look at, uh, which I call the Homo sapiens food paradox. And uh, on the one hand, in terms of the number of species, not the quantity that's consumed, uh, that's a conservative estimate um, that around 10,000 taxa are consciously identified by some people somewhere in the world and consumed at, at various times and places. Now, if we compare ourselves with other great apes, great apes have a considerable knowledge of the plant world and uh, uh, may recognize uh, tens or almost approaching 100 or so plants, but there's clearly an order of magnitude shift in just the extraordinary large number of um, plants we recognize as something to consume, or at least some societies recognize that. And the contrast with that is if one uh, goes from the list to quantities, uh, the pattern in the modern world is entirely opposite, that um, uh, in calorific terms, the majority of what enters the human food chain uh, comes down to three grasses, uh, wheat, uh, rice, and maize. And that, that is rather a small number compared to what uh, our other uh, relative uh, species uh, eat. And it's not entirely self-evident uh, why, uh, why that's happened. And then, of course, for obvious reasons, those three grasses are at the centre of contemporary discussions of food security and uh, climate change. And so what I really want to do is, is look in the past and see how, uh, how this came about, and as I say, um, generalise. And, um, and the methods that my group use are essentially threefold. On the one hand, uh, the evidence of the food is largely um, uh, um, uh, charred uh, grains, and those are the charred grains of barley, which allow a precise um, dates and, um, and context and precise taxonomical identification. Uh, in terms of how much the humans are uh, eating, the stable isotope uh, uh, measures uh, can be very valuable. It's quite useful that uh, some of the major families like grasses and legumes have some isotopic pattern to them. And the thing that we're using, uh, we embed these studies in, is genetics of land races. Those are living uh, plants that, because the farmers have acquired them from their family and not from the market, um, uh, retain an astonishing amount of bio biogeography in their genetics. And that can be supplemented by historic and ancient DNA to anchor it back uh, in the past. And because it's uh, late in the conference, I'm going to give you the answer 
uh, at the start of uh, my talk, and I'm going to say that uh, the step, the movement from looking at 10,000 10, and so plants to <coughs> emphasizing three, uh, I'm going to take it down to four episodes, and I give it a sort of time bound from then. Um, I go through them one by one, so even if they don't make a lot of sense at the moment, um, uh, hopefully they'll make, a, make some sense in due course. <coughs> so if we take uh, the local domesticates and go back about 10,000 years ago, here you've got uh, some maps of centres of uh, agricultural origin, and I've superimposed on, those, on that map um, uh, black uh, pointers to show the various places in which cereals, which is all cereals are, are, are domesticated grasses, um, uh, have, have been domesticated. And I want to emphasize that although, as I say, three species dominate, there's something like 50 species that have experienced that genetic loss of autonomy we refer to as domestication. And you can see this whole latitudinal band across the globe where uh, grass eating is a key thing. Grass seed eating goes back, we know it goes back at least um, 75,000 years ago, and we have um, remains of grass consumption in Africa of that date. And it is just, as I say, in the last uh, 10,000 years that you get that series of genetic shifts that we describe as domestication. Now, in describing it as domestication, uh, that, for a lot of people, has captured the whole idea of human ecology um, and how that fits with the environment. But what I want to uh, emphasize is in this first stage, um, the kind of uh, uh, model is like different. Before doing that, I just want to say I, there's a, a, num a, a large number of uh, crops that have been uh, domesticated. And I'm going to focus, to make it sound, I'm going to focus on the cereals, the grasses. And I just wanted to say something about uh, them in ecological terms. Now, the split in cereals between uh, large grain cereals and small grain cereals is kind of arbitrary. If you take a cereal like sorghum, it goes right down the middle. But by dividing them like that, one can get a sense of how they're quite different plants and how they have quite different relationships uh, with humans, environments, and calorific input. And so on the one hand, you have the large grain ones, including the big three wheat rice and maize. There's about 20 taxa. They're often C3 plants, but maize is an important exception. They have a long growing season, and they're good sinks for pouring in whatever nutrients and water one can supply to them. Um, they're, they're triggered by um, environmental triggers, and uh, we produce a lot of them, and the, the amount of producing is increasing. By contrast, the word the English word millet is just a collective term for the residue, these small grained cereals, and there's rather more taxa. Um, they're very often C4 plants, a number of them we don't know whether they're C3 or C4. They have a short growing season and modest, and can be very modest water requirements, and they uh, don't uh, have to be seasonally triggered for their germination in the same way. And they're um, a much smaller quantity, about 12% of the cereals, and they're um, declining. And so, in terms of the cereals that, um, which are so important calorifically, at the one end, we have these kind of, uh, these large calorie sinks that get switched on by the seasons, and then just get bigger, and ideally get bigger and bigger as one puts water and nutrients in, in, into them. And at the other end, you have one, there's this much more resilient opportunistic plant that captures um, short bursts of sunlight coinciding with um, the right temperature and the right water amount to capture a season and, and uh, get uh, through the growing cycle um, quickly. <coughs> and um, so as I, I, as I said, uh, today we're going completely over the left hand side and uh, much less um, on the right hand side. And if you look at this early stage of agriculture, um, and you see there I put the site in Inner Mongolia uh, uh, around uh, eight to seven uh, uh, and a half thousand years ago. And this is typical of a number of the early sites that you get there, that it's, it's perched on the foot, or, or around the world, perched on foothills, uh, gathering uh, a rain runoff. And here's uh, 
uh, this, uh, the actual site. And uh, here's some of the floated millet grains that are, that are on there. And so this is a typical early farming site. And in many places of the world, you get these foothill-based sites early on with a domesticate there. But what I want to um, emphasize is that they're both, both variable, and there's a number of elements of them that, um, um, that, that are not quite how we think of a farm in terms of a modern mindset. Quite often, in each of these ones, there's an individual, individual domesticate grown quite close to its place, um, uh, place of origin, um, and it's, it's small, single-season, rain-fed plots on foothills. And the single season is important because um, that's, they're, only, they're, 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 they're triggered by the seasonal environment. There's one season of growth, and there's the rest of the year. And the critical thing that's coming out of the closest study in none of these early farmsteads is they haven't stopped using the vast, wild um, food chain. And in fact, there's been a number of case studies here, particularly in the posters, where people have clearly done work and got beyond the domesticate to show these early farming sites are very, very often an addition to that broad food chain and not a replacement of it. And part and parcel of that is, um, again connecting with some of the interesting papers we've heard, um, human far ecology, I would suggest, is an independent variable. Again at this conference, we've heard some persuaded examples of significant far impact without agriculture, with agriculture, and in addition, one could assemble um, examples of both without agriculture and with agriculture, and no real big deflection of the pollen rain. There's nothing intrinsic, I think, about growing small populations, growing small plots of domestica that has any significant <coughs> impact on the vegetation around it. So, um, so, I, uh, so al although the presence of um, domestica may be seen as linking to other things, I think it's an unnecessary thing and um, we're becoming more and more aware of large numbers of this sort of farmstead just adding to an environment without having um, a considerable impact on it. So that's uh, a kind of cameo sketch of the first episode and I want to go to the second episode now um, which I've described as cross continental exchange which I'll illustrate by a site that's somewhat similar, and Mulei in Xinjiang. And this is in West China. And again, it's a foothill site. And it's a site with a relatively um, uh, early Neolithic farming. And we were, um, we were interested to go there, but what you can see there is the modern uh, terrace farming. But where that uh, white uh, marker was, was a, a site the Chinese dug, and we knew there was an early population there. And we wanted to know what crops they were eating. And this is a quick summary of it. So you have a section through the site and some Neolithic artifacts. <coughs> and, um, and those Neolithic artifacts are stated uh, around the second millennium BC. And uh, within the flotation deposits, what you, what you get is two things. On the one hand, you get those same millet seeds. That have, um, and this is two and a half thousand kilometers west of Jinglongo the last site that was close uh, to uh, the point of origin. But in the same levels, there's a crop that's come uh, in the other direction, uh, barley, which has travelled 4,000 kilometres east of the Fertile Crescent, which is where we believe that was domesticated, and there's also wheat having travelled a similar distance. And so in this site, which is half the age of the last site, um, there's uh, an interesting pattern where crops are not are being uh, used not close to their origin, but um, are travelling in some distance. And if we place sites like Mule, and Mule is uh, where you can see the star there, um, on a sort of global pattern of, of, of uh, a similar thing going on, and I pulled together a series of, uh, of, uh, of records there, and this is the extent of cross-continental cereal exchange by 3.8 3 uh, uh, thousand years ago. And we have actually had a number, again, a number of interesting talks and posters on this region here. Um, and it's been mentioned through the work of Marco Modella and, and others 
that yes, that by this time, there are African millets and sorghum in India. The Asian millets have come uh, uh, to India. <coughs> and uh, rice has moved all over. And then the Western crops have moved uh, into China. And so there's this large scale thing going, going on. Um, another thing, when I look at that, um, when I look at that map, the, the words that are ringing in my ears, the words of uh, Ashok Singhvi on the first uh, day, who, who emphasized the importance of, um, of precision of, of dating these proxies, because a number of the dates there, and as I say, the dates span for se several centuries leading up to sort of crescendo about um, uh, 3.84 uh, thousand years ago. A number of them are dated at the moment by cultural associations. And I think it's absolutely critical to get direct dates on all these, which is something we're actually doing at the moment. It's been possible for about 25 years to do direct radiocarbon dates on the really large grains like wheat and barley. And the cleaning techniques for AMS dating now make it possible to go right down to these small grains. And so what we're currently doing uh, uh, at the moment is taking a number of these um, early records and doing precise uh, radiocarbon dates um, on the individual grains. And I don't think I'll, I'll be able to look Ashok in the eye once uh, 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 that's been done. You can see broadly the interest of it is it does hang over in some way. It hangs over um, the aridification curve um, and, and various events and so forth in an interesting way. But to actually explore it Properly, I think we need to get the um, those we take advantage of new technology to get the dates uh, out. And another thing one can look at this period um, is uh, uh, how it's consumed. Now here you've got a, the site of Mogu on the Hershey corridor, and this is a corridor um, that links east and west, and uh, is a is a channel ground down down which that uh, food, that cross-continental globalization can occur. And while the charred remains show the presence of the uh, crops, the, um, the, the bones allow us through uh, stable isotopic analysis of the carbon to look at the interchange between um, the, the C3 minutes, uh, the C4 minutes and the C3 uh, wheat and barley. And the nice thing again about tying up with the proxies is these same skeletal remains can be um, uh, the source of, uh, of climatic signatures and one of our group, Elmer Lightford, is, is looking at the, um, the teeth, and particularly animal teeth from these sites, to relate the dietary signal direct to a, um, a climatic signal. And to some extent the Hershey Corridor um, acts as a kind of uh, thermometer down which the, the uh, changing um, climatic um, circumstances um, move back and forward. And this is the kind of thing you get. Those are a series of sites, uh, of cemetery sites, and these are all, all these points are human bones. And along the, the horizontal axis is the Delta 13 uh, signature. You can see two groups uh, there, one corresponding to millet consumption and a shift. It's, I should say wheat, barley, and millet. They haven't stopped eating millet. They've added eat wheat and barley. But a shift around 3.9 kya, which not just an elite group or a subgroup, but the whole population um, is um, is switching what it has as a staple. And I just want to pause at this point to say that I'm going to say it in a few minutes that um, what they're doing there in uh, prehistory is kind of more flexible, I would suggest, than what happens in a later historic peri period. There's, when we come forward in time, there are clear examples, including the present day, where, the, where we seem to be almost stuck in particular species as sources of starch. And my impression is in this period, um, uh, they're taking advantage of this mixing of, uh, of cereals to actually play cereals like a deck of cards to fit a range of different cereals to a range of different environments. And another way we're looking at this, as I mentioned, is through uh, the genetics. And there you have um, uh, my colleague Harriet Hunt. And what she's growing up here are 
plants of these land races, which, as I say, are collected from, um, from farmers who don't use the market but, uh, but use uh, uh, kin networks. And um, there's a lot of the biogeography comes from these land races, and it's sort of ground truth um, uh, in the archaeological record by desiccated grains, this is wheat rather than panicum, um, which um, are fairly good sources of um, relatively intact DNA. And the other thing that is really important is because of the whole process of simplifying down to a few target varieties, um, there's, there's this historic material, a series of herbarium specimen stores that can uh, uh, spread the genetic diversity, and these are up to 100 and 150 years old, and their DNA is in great shape. And this is the kind of pattern one can get. This is one of the things that we use the, um, uh, the genetics for. You, um, each of those ellipses is a gene pool um, defined by these non-coding uh, regions. And the, the place where the majority of them overlap is precisely the same place where the archaeology shows the early minute um, exists. And so one can think of these gene pools as different movements, as representing different movements away from uh, the point of origin. The other interesting thing one can do with the land races is look at the express genes to see what that movement has entailed. And one thing we're really interested in, in a number of the crops we're, we're doing here, is, uh, is how environmental response genes, such as flowering time genes, um, are being, to some extent, sometimes quite significantly, switched off in the process of moving away from the point of origin. And the general impression is, on the one hand, uh, these crop mixtures are bringing together crops, some in the right environment, and others whose environmental triggers are suited to incomplete an environment. But in addition, that latter group is uh, progressively in this process getting its environmental genes switched off. And this, I think, is quite critical in how uh, uh, they're used, because how these mixtures of, of genes are being used. And here we have a bit of history from the time. This is a Sumerian uh, um, uh, text, which can be read. And it's very clear from this that they're planting in several different seasons. They're multi-cropping. And it'd be quite difficult to multi-crop if you didn't have cereals either from a completely different environment or with their response genes switched off. And so this grouping of mixed genes is going together with various forms of, um, of water management. Now, as I say, I'm generalizing enormously. What I would say across the world is these uh, crop mixtures from different places do coincide with the exploitation of the, of the, um, the valley bottom rather than the uh, foothills. Um, but whether or not it's a, a sophisticated, on one hand, rain fed agriculture can be very sophisticated and valley bottom agriculture can be very simple. I think the critical thing about valley bottom uh, agri uh, uh, water management is up in the hills the farmers are essentially negotiating with a rain cloud where this whole system depends primarily on the social contract with both the neighbour upstream and the neighbour downstream. And, um, and uh, that contract can be enforced in various ways. And I think, again, we've had a number of uh, discussions over the conference about what constitutes collapse in these societies. The proximal cause of many of those collapses of this kind of society is the breakdown of that contract, which may or may not connect to um, an ecological story. Well, I want to move now to um, <clears throat> the third episode, which is what I call cultural domesticates. And this relates to a shift, I think one can see, in the historic period in many parts of the world, where rather than that great flexibility of using lots of crops, crops become culturally fixed and one switches from a world in which a suite of crops um, is, a, is adapted to a particular landscape to one in which a suite of landscapes is adapted to a particular um, crop. And wheat is a very interesting example of this because from about, um, oh, sorry, from about uh, uh, 300 AD, before this time, in broad terms, the, bar, the, the geography of these crops on a continental global basis 
had some kind of tangible relationship with latitude, altitude, the normal environment of things. From about 300 BC, you get this extraordinary thing whereby the crop is actually mapping the progression of Christianity. And um, between 3,800 uh, BC, you can see within the Ark of Italian records very clearly uh, the bread wheat that makes white bread uh, push back um, the, the black bread of the heathens. And although it sounds kind of, it really is uh, picked up in the, in the records. And before this period, both bread wheat and rye are part of these mixes you get all over Europe. Um, but at a certain point, um, these crops get culturally fixed. And as I say, bread wheat is a very good example. And there's a continuation in that um, uh, uh, as bread wheat travels around the world. This is a fairly, fairly simple map of the major crystal of modern cultivation. I think that map is not really an ecological map. It's a two episode map. On the one hand, it's created by that earlier episode of continental globalization. But outside Eurasia, um, uh, these other areas are, are essentially the, um, the movement of Christian settlers. <clears throat> and of course, there's masses of history and masses of rhetoric here. And one can see the logic um, uh, whereby that happens. And it's very tough and leads to a different style of um, of uh, interaction between those environments um, and uh, a crop. And we know, for, particularly for, uh, for example, around the uh, Midwest and Dust Bowl, that um, even some quite central literature had a very clear idea of, um, between the ethics of being a hard-working Christian farmer and how um, the phrase was, raven would follow the plough, that if, if, if you drag the plough through the soil, it would drag water out of the sky, which of course um, uh, didn't happen. So I think um, uh, there's th this focus on particular crops uh, has provided a number of the instances of the most intense tension between environmental stability um, and, um, and crop use. I mean, it's an interesting discussion in terms of the earlier period on a global map how much of what is seen as collapse is, is kind of noise on the rigidity curve, whereas there are some um, significant other things here. And that last um, slide links us to my last episode, which is oceanic ex exchange, in that a um, uh, uh, crossing of bread wheat <coughs> of the Atlantic happened. And this is a, um, uh, something that went both ways. Um, Maize, interestingly, over the same part of the time period, has a rather similar story in that the presence of maize is one component of American uh, uh, agriculture. It goes back thousands of years. But if you look at the isotopic evidence of when maize is becoming a real focal staple, both in the, oh, sorry, um, both in the um, uh, North America and South America, it's in the first um, millennium AD, and it's at the same time that, that maize becomes uh, deeply embedded in certain cultural um, uh, narratives. And interestingly, as, as, um, of course, the Aztecs didn't invade Europe, so it was the Christian uh, settlers who brought this back. And it's quite interesting um, that in many, all over Europe, in many languages, uh, maize um, in this 17th century illustration is referred to as Turkicum frumentum, and in Italian it's still grind turco, and in English it's Turkish corn. Now, the, the more geographically astute of you will notice that maybe um, uh, for an American crop that's what we call Turkish is, is, is not quite on the button. But if you read, if you, those of you who know Shakespeare's a, a, a fellow will know that in 17th century Europe, what Turkish essentially implied was it was spiritual geography, not uh, physical geography. And this was, it's basically heathen corn. So you have Christian corn going to America and heathen corn. <laughs> Uh, coming back to uh, Europe. And uh, 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 Crosby has emphasized this period as a massive um, uh, change around of uh, crops around the world. And what I want to emphasize are genetic resources that are outside the mainstream market. So <clears throat> that's kind of elaborates what I think a sort of a four step process um, to. Uh, uh, to the shrinkage down to wheat, rice, and, and maize. And so finally, I just want to sort of 
say something about our theme. And I, I think it's very interesting that the organisers um, uh, uh, use the metaphor of a compass rather than a road map. I think a road map uh, gives the impression of, it, of a, a highway where a compass is more uh, brings to mind a ship tossed in, in stormy seas. And a lot of the discussion has been reasonably modest about looking back and looking forward. And I think the key thing I would say from looking uh, back across this is not that that history was free of exploitation, suffering, disaster and everything, but um, there are things that can broaden our minds about the future. I think if um, it's inevitable, oh sorry, it's inevitable that if um, the free global market for food um, uh, goes, goes unabated, the rational choice is to focus more and more tightly on the most profitable um, uh, producers, like wheat, rice and maize, whether or not they produce um, local um, risks. But if, and I think another part of the subtext is, is uh, of, of our whole agenda is some way or another, even if the global market survives, there must be some way of pricing and charging for resilience and state sustainability and building that into progressive taxation or whatever. And if that happens, it brings to mind um, something that is a kind of point of the future of work research. This is the state of play where we started looking at some of these minor crops like um, brewed corn millet. And all you need to know about these is that they're bits of data um, on gene banks. So express sequence tags, um, genome uh, uh, sequence service, so forth. And all you need to notice that if you look at the, the big ones, beer is, is pushing these ones up here, and look at the number of bits of information, and look at the amount of information um, for um, minute, which a very large number of people have as their staple. But the ignorance about these minor crops in terms of scientific knowledge is, uh, is different from uh, the knowledge of wheat rice and maize by a factor of around 10,000. And so there may be some, some uh, advantage in spreading our, uh, at least our scientific knowledge um, uh, in, in that point. But at this point, what I think I'll do is, that's my team that do my best job, and thank you very much for listening.